we've been working together for about 20 years. We've always been interested in nature and how we as humans experience nature. And very early on we started looking to nature and matter, physical matter that exists beyond the limits of our perceptions. So matter that we can't see or hear or perhaps events that happen over very long or very short periods of time. And this led us to start turning to the tools and processes of science and technology as a way to reveal these things to us. And through this, we ended up spending lots of time in science labs where we started to look more at the process of science and technology and started to question that more because we started to see the signature of the technology and science in what it was presenting to us. So in seeing nature through these mediums, we started to realise that there was the signature of man and technology on them. And over time, we've become much more interested in how they mediate our experiences of nature. Here we are showing Earthworks, which is a five-channel video installation, which is mainly a kind of sound artwork, where we've taken seismic data recorded by scientists and turned this from data into sound, mainly by speeding it up. But because it's already a waveform, it just naturally turns into sound. And it sounds like the thing you're, you imagine it to. So right now, we're listening to the sound of earthquakes. And this sound, it sounds aggressive, but it sounds natural and beautiful at the same time. And so we've taken different types of seismic data from earthquakes and glaciers and volcanoes, but also human-made um, seismic data. And the work was commissioned by um, a company called Sirige in Spain that build all the roads and the, the metros. And, and so we also recorded seismic data from their quarry and we are interested in how we're now in a, a new geological era called the Anthropocene, which is the human geological era. And, and so the idea is that we have now affected the planet so much that it's a new geological era. And that's not, it's not something that you should take lightly because geological eras last for millions of years. And of course, humans have only been around changing the planet for maybe 10 or 20,000 years. So this is, this is a big deal and it's still quite controversial. So the, the visual part of the work was really inspired by going to a Surige quarry and looking at the face of that quarry, you could see how layers of the landscape had been laid down over thousands of years. So at this particular site, it's an old riverbed so over 20,000 years, this river has gradually shifted across the landscape and you could distinctly see these different shaped stones and rocks. And so we went looking for ways that scientists try to form an understanding of that landscape. And we came across the technique called analogue modelling. And there was an amazing laboratory at the University of Barcelona where it's very high tech. I mean, they, scientists have been working in this way for hundreds of years, but the technology has advanced to the point where now, so they'll take a fish tank and they'll put in colorful layers of sat particles of sand. And then by applying motion and pressure, they can simulate tectonic forces. And then they do a time lapse of this and gradually over time, you'll start to get these undulating waveforms and they can quite accurately replicate landscape formation this way. So we took that as a technique to then apply our computer-generated animation to. We created a system with millions of particles and then we applied the seismic data to that. So the seismic data is not only the soundtrack for the work but it's also controlling the animation. So you start off with these colourful layers as you do in analogue modelling and then as the seismic data plays this system it reveals undulations and waveforms and gradually gets more and more noisy throughout the piece till the end when you're in the the Anthropocene seismic data, it's just noise, a wall of noise, visually and orally. A lot of our work deals with the idea of, of sound as a, as a form of landscape, something that um, exists spatially and um, we always think of it as waves and, and, um, and being spread out around us. So, our work's always looked at this idea of, of um, sound and landscape at the same time and we're always interested in how we can bring things to life that are invisible. So the sound is something that we make visual in this work. Um, so, but in, in many ways we're more interested in talking about how um, the human effect on the planet is actually trivial in, in a sense, in a geological 
era. You know, it, it affects us on a, on a personal level as, as, as a species, but in the bigger scale of things, you know, we, we will all be invisible and forgotten in the universe, you know, within a million or two years. And so it's, it's to put that sense of um, the sublime of, of the, the, you know, the insignificance of, of us as human species into context where you, you feel, you know, that force is bigger than yourself. And so all of our work is looking at ways that, that science reveals this world around us, which is vastly bigger than we can possibly imagine. And we try to create a context that allows you to think about things that put us in, in perspective. This work in this space has kind of changed how people experience the work, I guess, on many different levels. We love how the work cuts through the space, so you have the pillars in the space, and so it's really communicating with the architecture. So on the one hand, you know, the work is talking about this work on a scale of a landscape, but then it's contained within a kind of a human scale. And we're always interested in exploring man's relationship to nature and the scale of that, and immersing man within the landscape. So that for us has been really exciting. And then also existing in a way where it's really open plan and having conversations with the other artworks. There's lots of works here that are exploring landscape in different ways. And there's echoes of our work in those works. And then you can see the work framed through the other works. It gives you new perspectives. So there's all these new relationships that are emerging as the work is installed now. Because of our interest in, in sound and landscape and, and narratives through landscape and sound, we realise that there's a connection between this work and Aboriginal paintings and it has a lot of visual similarities and it looks like the pointillist kind of framing of, of um, song lines within a landscape and this is just a coincidence but it was quite apparent to us when we first made it and we had no idea it would be shown in Australia at some point. So when we make works like this where we're working with data and we produce computer generated animation, there's always man's signature present in there because we're using the technology so you get a sense that it's something technological that you're looking at but there's always a certain amount of complexity as well which is what nature brings to the work and so we allow these things to both be kind of as raw as possible so we always say we like to work with raw data so that we want to work with the data as close as it has been to nature before it's been changed so in this instance we're working with seismic data so it's being collected um, as a series of numbers which then become a waveform and so that waveform you can directly translate into sound without having to change the data so you're actually listening to exactly the vibrations caused by those various uh, landscape seismic activities and then similarly with the data being used to control the animation that is having a direct control over the animation so there's certain things I guess which are the hand of the artist, which come down to um, the limits of our perception. So in order for us to hear the seismic data, we have to speed it up. So the seismic data that you're listening to has probably been collected over several months. And then we're listening to it over the period of like a several minutes. So we have to do that just to bring it within our audible range. So there's certain things we have to do, but they're all to do with the limits of how we as humans in, in perceive term, the world. In terms of how we animated it, we, we um we did create an algorithm that, that listens to parts of the sound, but the seismic data is recorded, recorded through many different sites, and we could take these sites and we could take the sound from here and the sound from here and then attach it to different parts of the layers. And so um, it, it would have its own automatic way of, of movement, but we'd, we also went in and had a, a kind of bespoke level of um, adjusting things to actually make it more... Um, uh, feel more comfortable, more natural. Um, it's, not, it's not just automated. It's, in all of our work, um, we've, we take this relationship between us and the computer, which for us is why we're called semiconductor. And the, the computer is controlling us and trying to decide how the work should be aestheticized. It gives it a computer feel. And we're trying to put humanism, human nature back into the computer. And so there's this fight between the aesthetics of the computer and, and the human within our work. It's 
So people often ask us if we've studied science because we have worked with science quite a lot and have um, spent a lot of time in science labs. But our interest as artists has always come from humans in the physical landscape and we're interested in physical matter. So we've done a lot of artist residencies where we go into science labs and they're always laboratories that are looking at matter in different ways. So we've worked with space physicists who look at the sun or relationships between the sun and the earth and magnetic fields. We've worked in a mineral sciences laboratory at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington DC where there were volcanologists we worked with and mineralogists. So studying matter on an atomic scale. And then recently we completed a residency at CERN, the particle physics laboratory in Geneva where they're trying to understand matter on an even smaller scale, kind of the fundamental kind of makeup of matter. So we're always interested in the different techniques and processes that scientists are using to do these things. And as time has gone on, we've become more interested in asking more philosophical questions of science. But the, the roots of those interests have always, for us, been nature.